जय राधा कुंज जय राधा कुंज हरि हय ढाई गोपी जन बाबर ढाई गोपी जय गोपी जन बाबा गेवरी वर ढा गोपी नंदन भ्रजाधन हंझानायस जसोद नंदन भ्रजाधन हंझानायस जम्मू न थेरा जमून थेरा छी जमून राधा कुंज बिहारी Keep the same beat and just go faster. Bhuki janna vala ba, kiri vada hari aya gopi. Gary, here I go. Be the one, the one. Gary, here I go. Gary, here I go. Just so the nandana, bhaja jana hanja na yas. Yasor nandana. Rajajan Hanjaya, Jammu na thira, Van Chahari Jammu na thira, Jammu na thira, Van Chahari Jammu na thira. Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya And so this is five verses in one here and verses 8 through 12 chapter 13 chapters entitled nature the enjoyer and consciousness so and this particular verse is the 20 items of knowledge so we can um, go for let's see 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll do the second verse. <clears throat> Bring the Sanskrit up so we can do the verses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll go for the second one in the list of verses. That one, yep. That one there, Indriyartha, yeah. Indriyartha ishu vairagyam. Anahankara eva cha Janma mityu jara vyadi Dukha dosha nudarsanam Indriyarteshu vairagyam Anahankara eva cha Janma mityu jara vyadi Dukkha dosha nudarsanam. Okay. Indriyartha Arteshu In the matter of the senses Vairagyam Renunciation Anahankara Being without false egoism Eva Certainly Cha Also Janma Of birth Mityur Death, jara, old age, vyadi, and disease, dukkha, of the distress, dosha, the fault, anudarshanam, observing. Okay, so this particular sense here, it lists the 20 items of knowledge. In this particular section we're hearing, um, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age, and disease. Yeah. Okay. So this is that particular section. So these are part, and then Krishna, after mentioning all of them, he says, all, all these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever there may be, is ignorance. So what Krishna is saying Outside of these 20 items of knowledge, there is no other knowledge. Okay. So we'll go on to the uh, purport. False ego means accepting this body as oneself. When one understands that he is not his body and his spirit soul, he comes to his real ego. Difference between... uh, well, what is, do we get rid of ego? No. Ego remains, ego means identity. But false ego means the wrong identity. So the basis of the false ego or wrong identity is bodily identification. And from bodily identification comes other senses, senses of false identification, such as gender, I'm a man, I'm a woman. Um, I'm from this particular country. 
I predict this particular background. These are my family members. These are my friends. This is my society. Again, all the way, all of the identifications that the uh, conditioned souls takes on in relationship to the body. So the body is the foundation for where all false ego stems from or begins from. So when you understand that you're not this body, then all of these other designations don't apply anymore because they're all connected to the body. So then you understand, well, if I'm not this body, who am I? Am I your body? I'm not my body, but maybe I'm your body. No. <laughs> or maybe I'm a nobody. <laughs> But well, really what it may actually means is that you are the driving force that makes the body alive. You are the soul or spirit. So that is real ego. Jivir Surupai Krishnara Nitya Das. Real ego means to understand you are a spirit soul. But not only that, that is only the first step in personal identification. It means well, what is your relationship as a spirit soul? You are a servant of Krishna. Before then, we are Maya Das, or servant of Maya. Now we're Krishna Das, that's who we are. So we're not Maya Das, we're Krishna Das. So that's, that is the beginning of enlightenment. As Krishna goes through the second chapter in, in Bhagavad Gita, he very thoroughly gives various distinctions between the difference between the body and the soul, or what is eternal and what is temporary. Obviously, we all know the body is temporary, but we desire to live eternally. That desire is an indication of our identity. And that identity is that we are, we do live eternally, but not in this body. So we are not the body, but we are the uh, inhabitant within the body, which is pure spiritual energy, and which doesn't die, <clears throat> and nor is it born. So when we come to that understanding that we get rid of all of these false designations, that I'm, I'm a man, I'm a woman, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm from you know, Slovenia, I'm from America, I'm from Croatia, I, uh, this is my family members, these are my friends, this is Janasa Moham Yam Maham Mameti. The concept of I and mine make up the two features of the false seeker. I means I am this, and then mine means the things that I possess, such as, you know, I have wealth, I have family members. I have uh, possessions, I have, the, you know. So I and mine is the janasa maham, maham mameti, aham, that means the false sense of self and in extensions with the bodily relationships that come with that false sense. So we're none of these things. In fact, we have nothing to do with this world at all, zero. <laughs> but we're in it, that's the problem. It's like if you're thrown in jail, you can't say, well, I'm an inhabitant of jail. You don't want, you know, you're just here because of being, being punished. So you're forced to take residence into a, a limited type of existence called a jail cell. You don't really like it there, and at the same time you want to get out. <laughs> so, and, and you really don't care about anything inside the jail because it, it simply means your imprisonment. So when we identify with the things in this world, we are, we are building that, these chains of imprisonment. The first imprisonment is the body, and then the identifications that connect with the body are further entanglement in the prison-like mentality. So, so, um, and, of course, the strongest of all of them is the gender. <laughs> Man and woman seems to be the most strongest gender identi uh, false ego identification. Because that seems everyone relates to each other according to gender. And that reinforces that thing. So we have to do that 
in order to function in this world, we can't just discard this idea and act any way we want. But, but it's like it's like a drama. You're on a stage and you're playing a particular part as a woman, as a man in a particular country with a particular set of relationships. So it's a play. You're engaged in a play. And, and, and so you act out the play, but you don't think that you're the, the, the person you're playing in the play. You just, you know, you know who you are. Or you're just the actor who's playing a particular part. So we play a particular part in this role, in this world, as a particular uh, person, and we have a material identity, but that identity is our part we play in this world. And when the drama is over, the show is over, the curtains close, <laughs> and then we start next chapter, and we get into the same, next drama. So mitche maya the base, kachu base, kachu habubu. So life after life, we continue to play this role of material. So this is the false ego. And um, so that's the more gross understanding of the false ego. The more subtle I ask, uh, I understanding is that I identify that what I do is actually coming from me. In other words, I did this. But Krishna says, Ahankara vimudatma kartaha miti manyate. You're not the doer, and this is also a symptom of the false ego. We are performing an activity under the guidance of the material energy, and therefore we act out a particular desire in relationship to one of the modes of material energy. And the modes connect us to a particular con consciousness that is based on the desire we have. We have a certain desire, we develop a certain consciousness based on that, that connects us to the material energy, and the material energy help, carries out the activity and, and gives us the result. But all we do is desire, really. We're performing the activity by going through the motions because desire is not stagnant. If you desire, you, motive, you, you move things. All of, as soon as you desire something, you, you're moving the material energy. And that material energy is then moving you to, to, to perform the activity based on that desire. Well, that's how it works. Uh, but you, the soul, doesn't do anything. You're just kind of witnessing all of this. It's like in the night, in a dream at night, we kind of go to sleep and we see ourselves in the dream. And nothing's really happening, but we're watching this for show in the, in the dream. So this, that, that's a night dream. So in the day, we're also doing activity here. But we're watching the activity, and we're not really doing the activity. We're just going through the motions, that's all. Because the soul doesn't touch the material energy. But the mind, uh, directed by the false ego, makes the, the individual think, I am doing, I am suffering, I'm enjoying, I did this, I didn't do this. This is all part of the false ego, which is uh, centers around the mind's desire. That's... So ultimately, but when we engage in devotional service, we are actually connecting us, the soul, to Krishna through that service. The service is the connecting force to the Supreme Lord. And then we get, because devotional service is, uh, it's called uh, daivi prakriti, spiritual energy. So it's, although it's, uh, it looks just like the, the activities of the conditioned souls, but it's not because it's not based on getting a particular results for one's own personal gratification. It's based on serving the Lord in a certain way. And therefore, that activity is the connecting force between the soul and the Supreme Lord. And therefore, we connect through the process of devotional service, which is also daivi, or spiritual. The service is spiritual, the activity is spiritual, and the connection is spiritual. And the soul awakens its existence in connection to Krishna through that activity. 
although it may look like ordinary material activity, it's not. <laughs> so, but when the conditioned souls do th something, they, I did this, or I didn't do this. In other words, they take credit and... Uh, but we also act, but we're acting under the influence of the spiritual energy and not the material energy. <laughs> so there's no false ego there. There is that is real ego. Real ego means Jivir Surupai Krishna Nitya Das, I am servant of Krishna. So and being servant of Krishna, I serve Krishna. That's real ego. And that's my identity. <laughs> And my material identities are just based on the body, and ultimately they're always changing anyway. One life you're a woman, next life you're a man, and vice versa. One life you're in one country born, another life you're in another country born. One life you're in a human form, another life you're in a lower form. So the bodies are always changing, the forms are always changing. That's the material energy. But once you get a human form of life, then you can raise yourself to spiritual consciousness and get a spiritual body. Once you get, then once you get a spiritual body, you're no longer taking, you know, no longer connected with this material energy. So there's no ego. The real ego has manifested in the form of devotion to to Krishna. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. So Prabhupada goes, yeah, I am Brahman, I am spirit. It exists in the conditioned stage, it exists in the liberty says. When when a sense of I am is applied to the body, that's false ego. We can't give up ego, because ego means identity. If one should try to understand the distress, so that's that's a little bit about false ego. Any uh, questions or comments about identity, false ego? Clear? Everything's clear? Yeah? Huh? Not clear? Yeah, yeah. The sense of material identity is long term. It's called uh, nitya bada. It means that we've been in, in different bodies from life after life. So we reinforce that consciousness that I am a body. And it becomes so strong. And we live in a world where everything is centered around bodily and bodily relationships. So that reinforces it. So if you want to get out of that wrong conception, you have to act on the spiritual platform. And at the same time, not identify yourself with your material identities. You're not a woman. You're not from Croatia or some Slovenia. You're not old, you're not young. None of these things apply to you. All of these things apply to your body and you're not the body. <laughs> when you know that, you're free. Freedom means uh, uh, I belong to Krishna, that's all. And when you when you leave this body, what happens to the body? It goes into the ground and turns into yeah, three things: either ashes, stool, or what's the other one? Three things: ashes, stool, or earth. Yeah. If you get buried, it turns into the earth. If you get burnt, it turns into ashes. If, it, if it's eaten by animals, it turns into stool. All right, Bo. Take a look in the mirror. You can see which one do you want to choose. You want to make it, make it into ashes, stool, or earth. 
Oh, I have this nice body. Let me see. When it ends, what will it be? Hmm. Let me see. Oh, yeah. I'll, I choose earth. No, maybe ashes is better, not stool. <laughs> well, that's that's the three destinations of the body, one of the three. So right now we think, oh, I miss body so nice. It's giving us so much trouble, but at the same time we think it's so nice. <laughs> In the morning, you have to you have to shake it to wake it up, <laughs> and you have to go to the doctors to keep it healthy. You have to breathe fresh air to make sure you can still exist. You have to do so many things just to maintain this thing. Well, the soul doesn't need any maintenance. It's already self-sufficient. It exists without any separate endeavor. It needs nothing. The soul doesn't go to the doctors. <laughs> you got it now? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All right. At the time when you leave the body, you'll get it. <laughs> At that time, you'll you'll get it. <laughs> Hmm? I don't know which country begin that it's no boy and no girls, only the same, that we have no gender. There's only two genders. God created these things. We don't care what the, the material society wants to come up with. And so they're all, they're all crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's complete crazy. There's, there's boys and girls. Zenki and Muski, right? <laughs> You're either a Zenki or a Muski. <laughs> You're not a Mus 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 Zen Zen Muki. <laughs> you can't be in between. You're either a, you're either in a female body or you're in a male body. Either one. There's only two genders. That's all. Did you learn that in school? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I you know I, when I travel, they give me a form to fill out, and I have to fill out the form, and then it has gender, and it has uh, male, female, and other. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it and on the form. You can check the other box. And then I was told there's like 27 different others that, you know, I mean, this world is crazy. People are crazy. It's just complete craziness. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you're either a male or a female in this material world, that's all. You're not in between. What's in between? What's the other? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Comes right down to it. What other gender is there? <laughs> there's only two. In the spiritual world, there's Krishna, and he has his cowherd friends, and then there's the gopis. <laughs> there's only two genders, even in the spiritual world. Of course, there's animals, but they also have their genders. Hare Krishna. So, yeah. You got it? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Any other questions about false ego? <laughs> okay. We'll go on to the next one. This is a deep one. I mean, false ego is really... If you really want to know more of the intricacies of false ego, read Bhakti Tirta Swami's uh, Beggar Number Four. Yeah, Beggar Number Four is all centered around false ego. Mm -hmm. 
And it's good. He'll give you storylines and examples of how false ego works, you know. Okay, the next one is, one should try to understand the distress of accepting birth, death, old age, and disease. These are descriptions in various Vedic literatures of birth. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the world of the unborn, the child stays in the womb of the mother. It's suffering. And this is all graphically described. It should be thoroughly understood that birth is distressful because we forget how much distress we suffer within the womb of the mother. We do not make any solutions to the repetition of birth and death. So, you know, when you come out of your womb, mother's womb, you're not like, Hare Krishna, Jai Ho, here I am, Choo. No, they have to, they, they whack you on your backside just to get you breathing. And sometimes they have to cut the mother open a little bit more so, so the wild baby can get out and she's suffering. Lady, you know, you gave birth, right? You have one child. It's not easy. It's really difficult. Men don't understand what women have to go through to give birth. They go through a lot of trials, carrying the baby. Of course, it's based on love, and therefore it becomes a burden of love, but still it's a burden because there's a lot of distress carried connected with that. You know, when Prabhupada, one devotee was telling Prabhupada, I worked on the ambulance, and many times we would get calls from women in labor. So when they go into labor, that means that they immediately have to go to the maternity ward to get ready to give birth. And he was saying that the, the women, they were cursing their husbands. Never again. Because the pain is, sometimes the pain is really unbearable. And I've even talked to women who describe how bad, how horrible it is. That the pain is so bad that you you actually go beyond pain. You you just it's just even if they try to give you some kind of you know anesthesia or something, it's still the pain is intense. So yeah, so for the woman, it's giving birth is not easy. And for the child in the womb, packed up in a little bag, airtight bag, can hardly breathe. Whatever the mother eats, the child gets. If the mother eats something spicy, the child is, is suffering inside. Sometimes the mother can experience the child is bouncing around inside, and the child is really feeling the discomfort of being in there. And so, yeah, so birth is not, an, an, not an, an easy thing. It's one of the four miseries. And then, but when you, you know, when you grow up, they say, well, happy birthday. But it wasn't so happy when you were coming out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not it's just the way it is. It's just not a very pleasant experience giving birth because as it says in the scriptures, that the soul is not meant to take birth. So it's unnatural, and therefore there's a lot of suffering. Therefore the four, four forms of suffering, birth, disease, old age, and death. So we know about disease, it's suffering. We know old age, some of us don't know it yet, but you'll know it when you get there. And when you get old, old just right, Mataji? Well, you're pretty strong and healthy. You're just like a young lady. And so, but some people, when they're old, can't walk, can't see, can't hear. Yeah. Ah, what did you say? Can't you know? Uh, can't yeah. You, know, you have to have you have like a hearing aid. You have glasses. You can't see. You have a cane because you can't walk, or you're in a wheelchair. And there's always problems. <clears throat> well, old age is a lot of problems. A lot of physical problems. And then the whole show is over. That's called death. <laughs> and 
And for, for the non-devotees, death is like being bitten by 10,000 scorpions. That's what it says in the scriptures. The pain of death for the non-devotee is like being bitten by 10,000 scorpions at the same time. For the, non, for the devotees, it's not like that. And devotees can somehow or other move outside of the body with not so much pain because Krishna helps the soul if the soul takes shelter of Krishna. But the idea of death is the pain of death. Oh, I don't want to die. So that distress that comes with the idea that I'm dying is the real pain. But as soon as you accept that death is part of life, then just the way it is. <laughs> so one has to have, the, and it says here, one has to have the perception that these four things are causes of suffering. And Prabhupada goes on to say, uh, similarly at the time of death, all kinds of, and they're also mentioned, this should be discussed, we should be discussing, well, what is this birth, death, disease, and old age? And Prabhupada goes on, as far as disease and old age are concerned, everyone gets a practical experience. No one wants it to be diseased. Sometimes if someone is dying at a young age, they're not, they're not even reached their teenage years, and they have many physical disabilities and suffering. I've seen so many children disabled even before they reach their teenage years. So many things. This, is, this world is just full of suffering. That's all it is. Unless we have a pessimistic view of this material life, considering the distresses of birth, death, and disease and old age, there is no impetus for our making advancement in spiritual life. We have to know this, this place is a world of suffering. So, and when you know that, you don't try to enjoy anymore. If this place is a world of suffering, why am I wasting my time trying to enjoy here? <laughs> How can I enjoy in the prison house? <laughs> so that's intelligence. Any questions about these four? Birth, death, disease, and old age. We're getting... Now, the disease factor becomes very prominent now in the world. And the fear that comes by, by when disease starts to spread, that's another form of, of suffering, fear. That's a mental form. That's even worse than disease itself. Now, this world is just full of suffering. It's just all it is. And you may be healthy, and all of a sudden something happens, and then you're in a different zone. One minute you're okay, and next minute the doctor says, yeah, make your plans, because it's not, time's up. <laughs> so, yeah. so we're not afraid of death, we're afraid of wasting time trying to still help make plans to enjoy in this world. So whatever time you have left, and Krishna will give you enough time to, to make the solution to these, design, these things to enjoy. He'll give you enough time so you can get over this idea that there's happiness in this material world. <laughs> happiness is there in relationship to Krishna and Krishna's devotees. But that's not material. How much money do people spend for health, for preventative health, for recovering of health after it's lost? Bill, not billions, trillions of euros, not just billions, trillions. It's the biggest expenditure in the world is health care. Either preventative, you know, I just go inside of my, in my room there, I open up the cabinet and I got this for this problem, this for this problem. 
this for just in case I get this problem. <laughs> I was just, just, just checking today. Another problem just recently came up and I was just checking all the solutions. Opened up my cabinet. I found I had a few items that could help. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> you just have to live with it. That's all. It's, it's material world. Okay. Anything? Any questions? Birth, death, disease, and old age. Janma mitra jara vyadi. Hmm. This year is seven years when my my husband's um lived uh spotted seven years ago. Seven years ago from this year. And so I just came at home. So I was there when he left. And so it's it's really then I, I wasn't aware of Bhakti. I'm one and a half years in Bhakti now, but I'm so, now I'm so, uh, um, I'm grateful that, uh, that Krishna gives me this uh, strength and such, um, what would it be able to look for? Uh, Straight to carry on. Yeah. Well, that's practically impossible. Yes, that was the, 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 the Nobody can leave peacefully unless they're a devotee. The, the greatest, hardest thing that he could It's not possible. Because yeah. nobody... One of, There's no repair. You have to bring him to bhakti. <laughs> you can't die. And people can't die peacefully because they're actually afraid that, that what will happen after death. They don't know where they're going to go. And sometimes when they die, just like one devotee he was in the hospital with some other people around him, and he was experiencing people dying around him, and they die in a very fearful situation because they see the Yamadutas coming. Uh, these guys are real. <laughs> and and for the sinful person they grab the soul and, and yank it out of the body and then give it bring it to Yamaraj. And Yamaraj gives them a subtle body and then they have to go to the hellish regions to suffer in their subtle body. And when they suffer enough in their subtle body, then they get into another gross body and they start again. It's not a very, it's all described in the 26th chapter, the fifth canto, the hellish conditions. I was just reading that today. I gave a class on one verse from that. The people who are engaged in uh, abominable sex life, I mean, not just sex life, but really abominable sex life, like between man and animals, and like that. Sometimes people have sex with cows and dogs, and, and they, they're taken to Yamaraj, and there's a tree, and they, they're hung up from the top of the tree, and the tree has all thorns on it. 
And the Yamadutas pull that person over the thorns all the way down the tree. And his body is ripped to shreds. <laughs> that's the punishment. <laughs> and it is, that's one of the, there's 28 hells, I think. So there's so many different ways that the conditioned souls have to suffer. And they suffer in the life, and then after they die, they have to go through more suffering. And then when they've been fully suffered enough, because suffering purifies the soul and gets it back to a state of neutrality, and then they get another body again and start from there. And then their suffering begins again. You have to understand, this place is really bad. <laughs> it's it's horrible place. It's meant to get people to wake up. Hey, you don't belong. You belong with Krishna. Jeev Krishna Das, that's who you are. You don't belong in this world. <laughs> Until we get that through our head, that we don't belong here. And it's not a nice place. Well, some people, just like people go to jail and they try to make a nice place in jail, you know. They fix their cell up nicely and, <laughs> and maybe behave real nicely in the jail so they get some jail privileges. <laughs> but you're still in jail. <laughs> yeah. Can I say something? The, the, the last day, my, my husband was really, really peaceful. Whole day, he was really peaceful. Mm -hmm. Well, he came to terms to the fact that he had to die, so, yeah. As soon as you stop struggling, then you can be peaceful. Yeah. 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 A little deer did what? Deer. Yeah, was lost in the forest then. Yes, and came to the town. Came into the town. Yeah, that man is the guru. <laughs> yeah, we're helpless in relationship to the material energy. You can sit down and you can write how many ways you can enjoy in this world and how many ways you can suffer and tell me which list is bigger. <laughs> Just like you know, Radhana Swami makes this point, I always remember this. He says, how much pleasure can your, the, the little toe on your foot give you? How much pleasure is that, that little toe can give you? How much pain can it give you? <laughs> so you're thinking, oh yeah, yeah you know. Mm -mm. And somebody drops, you know, a hammer on your little toe and you know, that's the end. You're like, you're, you're sky high in pain. But, you know, someone says, oh, here, my net a little toe here. Here's some nice massage. Oh, yes. <laughs> How much pleasure is that? There's <laughs> no pleasure. <laughs> so, I mean, Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes a statement. He says, 
people want to know, well, wh why is this world the way it is? Why is it suffering? And he, and he simply quotes a statement. And the quote, the, the statement is coming from Krishna. Krishna says, you want to know why this place is like that? I made it. <laughs> so if you have any problems, you go to the top. <laughs> Krishna, what happened? You made this place all wrong. No. <laughs> you're thinking wrong, that's all. <laughs> if you want to be happy here, then you're going to suffer, that's all. Is that is that story with Prabhupada tells Lomasa Rish. Lomasa Rish was a very hairy sage. And he had a benediction that he can live one lifetime of Brahma for every hair on his body. On his head. Very hairy sage. So he was li he, he was living on the banks of the holy river and he had a few followers. And so they said, Guru Maharaj, can we make you a cottage? You need you don't have any shelter and you're just out in the open. He said, Don't bother, I'm not gonna be here so long. You know? <laughs> so this life is like a flash. You're born and then pretty soon it's all over. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a flash. When you get old you look back and you think, hmm, where how fast did that go? <laughs> Right, Lali? You look back and think, whew, that was fast. <laughs> jai si si panchatattva ki jai si si gornatai ki jai. But, yeah, so the spiritual master has come, he's the mercy manifestation. And he's, he's saying here, take this message. Take the message, follow the message, and you can be free from this material world. Engage in devotional service. That's all. When we're absorbed in devotional service, we're happy. When we're absorbed in doing something for Krishna or engaging in hearing and chanting, the material world doesn't even exist. It's like it doesn't even exist. <laughs> and that's the way it is because it's all based on consciousness. So when you're engaged in devotional service, you're, you're putting your consciousness in the Daivi Prakriti, spiritual when you stop then you then your consciousness gravitates back to the to the par the apara prakriti the uh, material energy so Prabhupada said maya and krishna are side by side if you turn and krishna is right in front of you and maya is all around you just look forward don't look to the side don't look to the back just keep your focus on Krishna and in devotional service. And use your intelligence how to serve, that's all. If you, if, if you activate your intelligence, and your intelligence is always working, how can I serve at every minute, then you're, you're always in the spiritual energy. As soon as you stop using your intelligence and letting your mind takes over, it starts to think, what can I do for enjoyment now? Right. Yeah. Stay on that platform where the intelligence is always active, thinking, service, every minute. And as soon as you stop, the mind says, hmm. okay, try this, try that, try this, try that. Hmm. Okay, birth, death, disease, and old age. So we covered two subjects, false ego, birth, death, disease, and old age. 
Anything, any final statements? Okay, we can stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.